Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. Um, one moment while I... We appreciate you registering and joining us in advance of this final quarterly webinar of the 2019 year. Our expert presenter today is Marty Moore. She joins us as the co-chair of AFS number 14, um, the Patient Safety Movement's uh, fall, fall Prevention. And today's presentation is titled, A Call to Action, Fall Prevention Thinking. Representing the Patient Safety Movement Foundation is myself. Um, my name is Haley Golden. I'm the program and event manager at the foundation, along with Ariana Longley, our chief operating officer, as well as Donna, our chief clinical officer. So we thank you for joining us and running through just a bit of uh, housekeeping items next. Um, firstly, here's our disclosure statement. Just running through that, um, there's no disclosure information, uh, no conflict of interest. Um, the learning objectives to highlight today are that you as a participant explore the latest evidence and best practices on fall and injury prevention, as well as evaluating influences that contribute to falls that are both known and unknown. And finally, being able to examine a model that can be utilized for development and implementation of actionable solutions for your particular organization. Just as a housekeeping, um, everyone is muted upon entry, and we do that to maintain um, good audio. This uh, webinar will be posted online to our YouTube channel um, for reference. At the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session, and we ask that you participate in one of two options. The first being, if you are a web user, you're able to raise a virtual hand, um, and Ariana will be monitoring that. So just if you do have a, something you'd like to bring up to Marty and just as a discussion point, please do raise your hand, and we will acknowledge you for your question and unmute yourself, or we can help unmute you to post that question. The second option um, is a bit easier. Just any time throughout the presentation, if you have a comment or a question, feel free to use the chat feature to enter that, and then we can acknowledge your comment during this question and answer time. Next, we're pleased to announce that this webinar is available to claim continued medical education or continued nursing education um, units. So, at following this presentation, you will receive an email from the Patient Safety Movement with which you'll be directed to MedStar, who's our accrediting body, to claim those CMEs. And quickly, a look at the agenda. So just this time now is to introduce the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and describe our actionable patient safety solutions, or for short, apps. Following that will be a 40-minute presentation led by Marty Moore. Um, as the expert presenter, and then as mentioned, 10 minutes for question and answer. A bit about the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We are a global nonprofit with a bold goal of zero preventable patient harm and medical errors um, worldwide. We, we understand that one patient death is too many, and so we are working towards zero. We are based on commitment. So there's no membership, no fee, something like that. We ask that hospitals um, and different bodies that they commit to our hospital and share their, their data, their findings. A little bit about who can take action. The first being hospitals and healthcare organizations. We ask that they share their information, their processes that are in place, that are actual work that is data-driven, showing how they are reducing morbidity and mortality rates. And we ask that they do this through making a commitment to our organization. The next being committed partners. So a way that this has been described is different organizations such as um, agencies, societies, nonprofits that are willing to advocate and wave a patient safety flag. Um, we ask that they commit to us by signing a commitment to action letter um, that just notifies that they um, stand with us in our mission. Third is healthcare technology companies. And with this, we ask that our focus is on operability and sharing of data. And so we focus on healthcare tech companies and we ask that they sign an open data pledge 
that says that they will not willingly or knowingly block data from being shared or willingly knowingly add a charge to different devices that then can share data. So this helps, again, from a healthcare technology standpoint, push towards that zero number. This is patient and family advocates. We understand that medical harm does face um, all of us. We're not susceptible to, to that. And we ask that patients and their families share their story on our website and, and utilize resources to um, build the momentum of what it means to be a patient advocate and how this is important. And here's a look at our actionable patient safety solutions, or again, apps for short. Um, we have 18 in total, but there are subtopics under each, of, each one of these, and that totals into 34 different challenges. For each of these, we have created an executive summary checklist, which allows a organization to run through, a hospital, to run through and identify where are they missing the mark and where, where are places that um, change can come about to, again, uh, increase their, um, their, uh, their patient safety efforts and lower those morbidity and mortality rates. These are available for free to download and share on our website. Um, the link is there at the bottom, so we encourage you to take a look at this. Here's a graph showing our impact to date. And so we're very proud to show that from our, our start in 2012, um, these are the different hospitals that have publicly committed to uh, our initiative of zero. And so last week we reported out 4,710 hospitals in our network. We're looking to continue to grow that um, as we move forward. And then again, our live saves annually. So this are, these are numbers reported out by hospitals using methodology, so they're self-reported. Um, and last year we report that over 90,000 lives were saved, again, through commitments to um, these different actionable patient safety solutions. And introducing Marty Moore, she is an expert on this topic of actual patient safety solution number 14, falls and fall prevention. Her education background is with a Bachelor's of Science in Nursing, as well as a Master's in Organizational Management. Um, she's also served on, as an adjunct faculty member for many different universities, the most recent being George Fox University in Healthcare Administration. She is an award-winning nurse with over 30 years in leadership as a Chief Nursing Officer, um, as well as a nurse educator a senior Vice President of Quality, both Magnet and a Corporate Chief Nursing Officer. Most recently at Medline, in her role as CNO, she led the initiative to develop and advance quality and patient, inpatient safety. And then prior to that was with Providence Health and helped um, confirm the third and Magnet accreditation through the American Nurses Credentialing Center. She has a lifetime of dedication um, to nursing, as well as being the recipient of the DAISY Foundation uh, Extra Nor Extraordinary Nurse Award. Um, we're really pleased that she is in our network um, and presenting on this as the chair of Actionable Patient Safety Solution number 14, which is falls and prevention. And would you please welcome me as, as I turn it over to Marty Moore. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, so, a couple of you have noted that I uh, have my video on, and, and thank you, I appreciate that. You will see me sip a cup of tea because I probably, like some of you, were blessed uh, at Thanksgiving with having lovely friends and family around who also brought viruses. So, I have a bit of a cold, and for that, I apologize, and please give me grace. Uh, you have the objectives in front of you. We're going to talk about what the latest evidence is that's out there and what we're seeing on best practices. We're going to look at how you uh, influencers can impact your falls programs and additionally some biases that's associated with falls. So I think it's really important to kind of step back away from what we think we know and start to open our minds to really what is the unknown. And then we're going to talk about models that you can utilize and think about how you move change and how you really influence your culture into action. So with that, if we can move along, please. 
So what we know is the fatality of falls in the United States isn't uh, a small number. As a matter of fact, in 2015, CMS reported that the cost of falls was $31 billion. If you think about that in relationship to healthcare within the acute care and the post-acute setting, it's about $18 billion. Now, the projections for 2020 coming out of the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare is $54.9 billion. Let me just kind of hang out with that for a moment. $54.9 billion associated to falls, injuries, morbidity, mortality, loss of income, loss of life. What we know is, is that um, CDC reported that there was over 30,000 lives lost yearly as reported uh, through them. And what we also know is, is that the long-term effects of that, because a fall isn't necessarily a short-term um, injury that might result in death, sometimes they do. What we absolutely now know is, is that many times a fall will occur, let's say in a hospital setting, and yet the death occurs maybe six months to nine months later. And I'll talk a little bit about that when you're looking at trending data, because it's really important for you to now start thinking longitudinal and really be looking at what's happening. Now, when we step away from the United States, moving on, please, what we know also is, is that the rest of the world is struggling with the, the issues of falls. I was very privileged. Um, and if we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, I was very privileged to be able to uh, present actually on behalf of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation over in uh, the United Kingdom. And in the United Kingdom, what we know there is, is that they too are struggling. As a matter of fact, it's a major initiative. Um, I actually am not seeing the next slide on this point, but I'm going to be very creative, bring it up here, hoping that you all are seeing it. Are you seeing it on, on your side? Well, we're having fun here. All right, so let me just share the story of that because they're, they're gonna flip through it. I had the opportunity to present over in the United Kingdom and in doing so I met with uh, healthcare leaders and healthcare leaders uh, uh, in essence said the very same thing that I have said and we have all said is that they're struggling. They're struggling with how to, how to assure safety. They're struggling with falls. Nobody wants it on their watch. And yet, when you listen to the leadership of those uh, specific countries, they're also projecting the same amount of issues that we're seeing here in the United States. They're projecting within the United Kingdom, 4.4 billion pounds. Australia is projecting 500 million Australian dollars. I couldn't do an equivalent for you. I apologize on that, uh, to what that means. And the Western Pacific Asia region is projecting double digit increase, not only in cost, but associated in death. I also had the opportunity to spend time in Japan working with the hospitals there, and they too also were very much thinking about how that they can pre prevent falls, not only within their health systems, but they're very much looking at in within the home settings because much of the care is actually done in the community. And I'll touch a little bit on that. So when we think about that, if we can move along, please. We start to understand that this is a global issue. And it's one that is imperative for all of us to be thinking about. Now, I want to step back for a second and tell you about my own story. My own story was one of, as a healthcare leader, I've been a chief nursing officer for over 20 years. I actually brought into my practice a thought that maybe falls are just what happens in hospitals. I mean, we commit uh, people to sleeping, not anymore so much, but it used to be that we would put them in with a stranger and sleeping in an unknown setting and we give them medications and we do all these things. And so I had this bias in my head and there was an incident that occurred. I was, I was uh, it was Mother's Day. I was going up actually to my own parents' place. Uh, they live uh, on a farm in Oregon. And I received a phone call and the phone call was, Ms. Marty, we want to let you know about a code. And the code um, was a woman whose name, they all loved her, called Nana. And Nana had had a cerebral fusion, knew to get up and uh, 
but not to call before getting up, knew to get up with assistance, as I um, was saying, and yet for some reason, Nana got up and was found on the floor. Through a series of events, uh, Nana ended up with tracheal edema. The best surgeons, the best anesthesiologists just happened to be in the hospital, and yet, uh, for some reason, nobody could intubate her. And Nana died. And when I met with the family, the family was palpable in their anger, palpable in their thoughts about really how this could have been prevented. And I remember, and by the way, I, I needed to share with you, the family was uh, a family of six attorneys. Um, and so it, it was um, probably one of the toughest meetings I've ever had because not only of the emotion, but additionally, they wanted to know and understand, and I couldn't answer. What I said to them is, is that I don't know the causative agents yet. I don't know why this occurred, but I will tell you that I will carry this, and I will use that as my leadership. And that actually started me on my own journey to think about and to understand all. And I had to look in the mirror and ask the question, myself about, do I view falls as one of the things that just happens in a hospital setting? I'm gonna tell you, I came to the conclusion that I don't believe it should happen in a hospital setting, and it is so hard. There is no silver bullet to this. But it is one that it has to be constantly woven into everything you do. So what do we know about falls and fall prevention? Well, we have our usual suspects, right, that increase fall risk. As a matter of fact, if you look at the risk screenings, you'll look at physical changes, medication, blood pressure. But I want to challenge you that we've become too comfortable really and truly in those falls risk. It's, as a matter of fact, it's almost become part of our routine. And when it becomes part of our routine, it becomes part of our memory muscle. And we start to think and look at it from the numbers or from what we know. But let's step back for a second and think about what is it that you don't know? What we're starting to see in the research, and, and I believe actually was a contributing factor to my story that I shared with you, is the fact that malnutrition plays a huge part in people's uh, weakness and their inability to uh, work on their gait and their balance. And, and then additionally, we also know is this hydration plays a huge part. And the combination of the two are now actually being seen as a higher contributor to factors that can increase fall risk. What we also know is, is that over the age of 65, almost 65% of patients lying in a hospital bed are malnourished. Yet we also know is that less than 10%, like around 3%, are actually seen by the dietitian. So the vast majority of those out there really and truthfully are malnourished, are dehydrated, and it's not on our risk screening, and it's not something that we're taking a look at. The other thing that, that I shared with you already is about memory muscle. And when we look in, at our intake and our assessment process, we fail to really think about the, the brain and how the brain's programmed. And let me give you an example. I shared with you that I was very privileged to speak in the United Kingdom about falls. What I didn't share with you is that probably one week before, um, my aunt passed away uh, associated from complications, pneumonia, from a fall. She broke her hip. Now, in looking at what had happened and trying to understand, her bathroom is always on the left. Where did she try to get out of bed? On the left. Where was the bathroom in the hospital? On the right. Everything that she had that uh, she needed to maneuver around, like her bedside table and all those things, were on the left. And yet it's not a question that we ask as we're doing part of assessment in thinking about safety. So I want you to just kind of highlight that and look at how is it that in your assessment you start to weave in kind of what's already there in memory muscle of the individual patient um, because it, it plays a factor in starting to really create a safety uh, zone and thinking about safety. 
Now, the other thing around what we know about falls and falls prevention is, is performance gaps in preventing falls. Many times, as I've traveled throughout the United States, even as I traveled uh, globally, um, I saw so many times where it, uh, preventing falls was seen as a nursing initiative. In DNQI, it's a nursing sensitive indicator. I've monitored it almost all my career uh, and looked at it. And when I stepped back and thought about safety, and when I stepped back and thought about how do we prevent falls, it has to be an organizational imperative. And I'm gonna come back to that in a few minutes, but I also want you to star that because if you're not having an organizational conversation, if you're not having a, a really and truthfully awareness, I call it organizational kind of consciousness around the fact that we all have to think about and look at uh, preventing faults. Environmental services as they're cleaning the room. We talked to them about replacing things. Remember I just shared with you about memory muscle and do we even ask where the bathroom is at home? And then do we create uh, safety zones to where maybe they don't ha have to try to get out to the end of the bed and try to get around it to get to the bathroom? Um, it's all those kinds of things. And again, I'm gonna touch on that in a few moments. And then think about using appropriate tools. Coming soon to you, here's a teaser. We're working on uh, maternal newborn falls. Newborn drops, while small in numbers, are very detrimental to organizations and very detrimental to the, to the uh, loved ones and to the infants. And so we're thinking about and really looking at how do we help you to continue to expand that safety zone. Well, what we know about appropriate tools, not only for maternal newborn, but also for adults, is that in many ways, those tools can now become embedded into our EMRs and they just kind of become a tactic. You have to think about, are they patient centered just gave you an example around where's the bathroom place. But additionally, there's other things that I'll, I'll share with you in a few minutes around patient-centered practices that the tools necessarily are not driving the behaviors that you want. You also have to think about congruency. Nursing is the one that typically does uh, the assessment tool. What we're starting to find now in the research, uh, Dr. Morris is doing a beautiful work around gait and mobility and core strength. Very few times that we have therapists really assessing for strength and weaknesses of gait and mobility and core strength. And that's where, you know, that organizational focus has to come together. It has to be kind of that whole village mentality around how do we assure we prevent falls. And then lastly, um, I've touched on this, but the tools that were used uh, to reduce the probability of an anticipated physiological fall many times gets put into an assessment many times, and I hate to say this, I've seen it, gets cut and pasted. I know we don't want that, but we do. And we don't really and truthfully have the right conversations about safety. And so I want you to kind of start that too, because I'm gonna come back to it. So if we can move on to the next slide, please. So here's many times the considerations often missed. One I've, I've touched on is the organizational knowledge. Have you had a conversation in your organization across the board, don't forget your uh, volunteers, around we don't want faults, not in our walls, not in our community. And so we need you to be part of that visual look and then use visual cueing Many times uh, there's been, you know, yellow socks and there's been gowns. I've been successful with using different colored gowns, but there has to be some way, even preserving uh, patient privacy, that people know that this is a person who might be high risk for falls. Some organizations have taken the stance that all people are high risk for falls. If you've taken that stance, and you're not using some sort of visual cueing, you then have to elevate the conversation around uh, consciousness in your organization. That means all eyes are watching. That means people speak up if they see somebody who might be looking fidgety. And, and additionally, that has to be an organizational focus. And I'm gonna bring that a little bit later now into the safety huddles. But if you've taken that stand, what we're seeing as best practices is, is that it is a constant conversation. 
it's embedded into um, orientation. Don't forget your academic settings. If you're a teaching hospital, it has to be embedded into your residence as well. I watched uh, a, a, a time where two residents, I didn't watch it, but I followed up on it, um, didn't understand really truthfully what our falls initiative was and watched an elderly woman get up, get out of bed and fall. They were standing there. And in, in looking at him, and many times he would say, well, why wouldn't they move into it? Think about when you were a student nurse, or think about when you were in med school or when you were in your training. So many times you were kind of afraid to do anything that might be out of step. So that's what they did. Um, and, and that brought to me, and I took on the onus that I needed to do a better job of really creating organizational knowledge. Now, the other consideration that's often missed is the fall risk status being continuously communicated and updated. Do we in report talk about the fall risk status? Do we have on our whiteboards what the risk status is so the family knows? And do we engage in that conversation? And I'll talk a little bit about patient and family engagement in a few minutes, but many times we seem to want to kind of self-contain it to our work versus really and truly that partnership that has to be there. And then that fall risk status being continuously communicated and updated brings it also into organizational consciousness. On the move versus in, instead of stationary and secure, there is fabulous research that's starting to come out now that we really have caused more harm than, and hurt by trying to keep people secure in bed. We have alarms, we have everything that, that um, we have tried to do, low beds, and believe me folks, I've done them all, sitters, to keep people stationary and secure. Remember earlier I was talking about the influences that are often missed? And one of the things is, is that by keeping people stationary and secure, we many times are actually contributing to weakness. So malnutrition, dehydration, and not getting them up and moving. So one of the things and one of the movements that's starting to happen is, and people are starting to see some really good research, uh, research or results on this, is they're getting them up and moving them. They're getting them up and walking. They're getting them up and ambulating. Instead of getting them out of bed into a chair, trying to keep those muscles engaged. The other part, by the way, about on the move is, is that protein plays a major factor. Now, you still have to think about renal considerations of those things. But what we also know is, is that muscles need protein, right? And, and we do a poor job in really and truthfully monitoring protein intake to help those muscles continue to move and, and that nutritional side. And so a couple organizations that I'm watching uh, the results from and I'm really liking are doing protein shots with MedPass. So they get like 15 grams of protein and a 30 cc, so they're monitoring and tracking and that way, they're, they're able to work on the other nutritional aspects of the dietary tray. It's really fascinating to see what's happening with this because people are healing faster, uh, incisions are healing, but they're getting up and moving. And they're starting to see some downtrending in their falls, which I love. I love that fact. Now, I want to bring you into safety huddles. And here's what I want to ask you. In your safety huddles, do you bring it to um, your organizational safety huddle, I, and most people are now talking about we had a fall, but do you bring your near misses around uh, falls? And, and do you kind of create, again, that organizational consciousness? When you do your safety huddles within your specific department, are you talking about who you feel is the highest risk? Who have you noticed is kind of agitated that you really want extra eyes on? Are you bringing that forward into that deeper conversation? And then I also around safety huddles is, are you sharing what is happening when you do your debrief? A lot of times uh, organizations will do debriefs, but they don't drive it out and share what the results are of the debrief. I have my own personal experience where we had a fall and we did the debrief. And I was doing uh, organizational rounds, and again, I stopped into environmental services. And environmental services, uh, I was just doing a town hall, and I said, I said, you know, we had a fall occur uh, last week, and here's what we've learned so far about it. I would love to hear 
your insight, your perspective. And one of the, our uh, associates uh, raised her hand and she said, well, I noticed that he was really getting kind of agitated probably about 30 minutes before the fall. And I said, did you feel like you could, yeah, that you could bring it forward? And she's like, well, no, I mean, you know, she did the just word and I hate the just word. She said, I'm just the housekeeper. And I said, no, you're part of the team. And so listen for that just word and move that out because that's actually a challenge for you in really working on your uh, elevation of safety. And what I found was is that she had valuable knowledge that potentially, don't know that, could have changed maybe an outcome. So help people to understand what they're looking for, build that into your organizational um, um, framework Think about all the people that come and go out of that space. Don't assume it's a clinical issue, it's an organizational issue. And then person and family engagement. And, and this is where I wanna talk really deeply about how do we partner. If we can move to the next slide, please. Person and family engagement, first of all, if you have not downloaded uh, CMS's white paper on person and family engagement, I would highly encourage you, please do. They have given you their roadmap of where they are going in their quality plan, and they've really outlined what they wanna see happen around person and family engagement. This is my own personal perspective. I watched the same actions around uh, patient experience primarily started with patient satisfaction, patient experience. They started with a white paper, they started conversations about it, and then it moved into where it became part of the value-based care and reimbursement. I'm not so sure that we're not on the same trajectory. So for me personally, it's the right thing to do, but I would also tell you in prepping your organization of where CMS is going, it's the right thing to do. So when we talk about person and family engagement, one of the things that I'm not seeing happening a lot, and yet it's cited as best practice, and those that really do partner and, and do a great job are achieving reduction in their falls. And that is you individualize the safety plan with the individual and the family. Now, understand something. CMS has taken a pretty bold step considering uh, in the past and the bold step is that they define family broadly to include participants in any in that person's care as anybody, informal and formal caregivers. Family is no longer related to DNA. Family is defined by the individual. And that is a whole different kind of um, step that CMS is taking to recognize is that we did no longer have kind of the nuclear family but family's very broad. Again, you know, I have watched many times in uh, organizations where family's been narrowed, and yet there was a family friend who had fabulous information about the habits and routines and the partnership that we were working to develop, they knew a lot of information about. So when you think about person and family engagement, it really requires transformation of culture and strategy. So if you think about developing an individualized safety plan, and in today's fast world and how we're trying to move people through, it, it, many times people feel like, well, we do that now. I'm gonna share with you, we don't do that as much as we should. And the questions that we should be talking to the family about and working with them on a partnership to reduce the faults of their loved ones are not necessarily the traditional, are, are not necessarily the traditional questions we're asking. I gave you an example about where is the um, um, bathroom within the, the individual's home. Some other questions that people are starting to utilize within their care settings is really listening and saying, tell me about your, your loved one. Tell me what, uh, have you seen them stumble? Are they weaker in the evening? Are they weaker in the morning? Do they complain to you about dizziness? And it's really getting kind of that information from the family and then developing what we should be doing for safety for that individual. And then we put it up on the whiteboard. 
So here's our plan. Here's what we're going to do. We, we talked about call, don't fall, those kinds of things. But many times the family has different information that they can share with you around how to keep their loved ones. Some organizations have gone into partnership contracting to where it's like, okay, here's the things we're going to be doing. Here's the things that, that we would love for you to be doing when you're in the room. Bring to us safety issues. If you notice them, if you come into the room and you notice that uh, the safety things aren't, you know, the bedside table's not where it should be or certain other kinds of things aren't there, um, bring those to our attention immediately. Many times families are afraid to speak up. And you have to invite that because they're, they're afraid of retaliatory and they're afraid of being listed as, you know, the family that complains too much. Really changing that person and family engagement is starting to see some remarkable. The other thing that I've also noticed is, is that at times when somebody becomes a little bit more agitated, a lot of times families will say, I'll, I'll stay, I'll sit with them. Um, and having that loved one close to the, uh, close to the patient um, or close to the person, in many ways, actually then calms them down and helps them. Now, the partnerships for safety also have to be developed at the first point of contact. And that's where your emergency department comes in. Think about the places that, that um, people that you're caring for come into your organization and start to work on that, at that reduction of falls, prevention strategy at every point in contact. One organization that I worked with did a fabulous job with EMS. EMS. And what they started to do is they pushed out beyond their walls and realized that falls is a community issue. And they did a fall uh, prevention at all of their grocery stores. Uh, they worked with EMS. EMS uh, uh, knows kind of, you know, who's the frequent flyers, their terms of mind. Apologize if that, um, you know, it's a term that uh, people don't enjoy, but um, one of the things with it is, is that they would many times stop in and see those individuals that were routinely coming into the emergency department. By doing that, they actually had incredible insight into the home setting, into the tripping hazards, into the lack of food. I mean, there was just so much. And so if you think about if you're in a community where EMS is very much community oriented, um, that might be a partnership. The other thing that um, I loved uh, in the UK was in last fall, they did uh, uh, public service announcements around fall is, falls are all our issues because there are loved ones. And they pushed out again into the community to help people to really have more consciousness and awareness of falls and what they can be doing to help prevent that within the community setting because um, it contributes then into the hospital setting. Next slide, please. So this is my own personal hashtag that I, I'm sharing with you. I'd love for you to take it and use it for yours, and it's hashtag leadership matters. Here's what I know. When I kept my focus on falls, and I worked hard on falls, one of the things that I, I uh, identified was that that kind of leadership focus really and truthfully was more um, keeping the organization more engaged. When I then kind of diverted over into whatever was happening at the time, uh, the, whether it was Cotty, reduced Cotty or whatever, falls kind of went away. And it told me in many times um, that I needed to think about how it is that I keep that consciousness uh, raised in the organization. And that's where I started to look at really and truthfully what matters in leadership, uh, hashtag leadership matters. So the first thing is, is the culture of safety does matter. And if you're not working on that, I encourage you, I would encourage you to look at the Actional Patient Safety Solution um, because this is your transformational work. When you do that, start to set up kind of a methodology to where you're always talking about the things that you're working on to keep people aware of the fact that, that this is important to the organization, this is who we are, this is what we're doing. The other part is data matters. And in many times, organizations are not tracking um, falls throughout their whole organization. And so the question I would ask you is, is are you tracking falls uh, throughout your organization? 
that includes your emergency departments, that includes radiology, that includes your ORs. Are you tracking falls within your uh, cl clinics, your physician offices? Are you tracking data that comes back or that they're collecting actually in that where they're noticing maybe more muscle weakness or some complaints of dizziness? Are you able to kind of bring that together? Because many times that starts to tell patterns that you can start to do some predictive modeling. And that's where some of the newest research is going as well is, is looking at predictive modeling to start to understand who, who might be higher risk not necessarily based on the assessments, you still need to do that, but also what you now uh, are understanding about the community. So that's where your social determinants comes in, what you're understanding about your community and what you're understanding about your population health and those matters. When we look at high reliability matters, as we think about hashtag leadership matters, what we also know about high reliability is, is that processes and systems are designed to ensure that that human beings do um, the right things at the right time. And in today's environment, it's really hard to remember to do all the things that we are supposed to be doing. I would encourage you also, Penn State just brought out design thinking and it's under uh, the School of Nursing. And what that uh, gives you are tools to help to utilize with your teams around how can you improve your processes to where it's really human centered. It, it, it brings in that behavioral science side of it. Because many times the tools that we're developing are, are not necessarily designed in such a way that it really guides best practice or really guides kind of what you want people to do. And then lastly, I really want to talk about engagement matters. And this time I want to talk about your employee engagement. This is where um, so many times as we're doing our fall risk and, and we're, we're looking at and thinking about the tactics that we engage the head. And by engaging the heart, we now know, and there's absolutely correlation and the research is clear, that, it, that employee engagement either drives quality, drives your, your safety programs, or impedes it. And engagement is not about satisfaction. Engagement is about my willingness um, to give you discretionary energy. As we think about reduction of falls, as we look at fall risk assessments, those are tools. They're tools that individuals are utilizing, but it's really and truthfully whether they choose to utilize that tool to take the next step. And that's the body of work also that I actually put um, employee engagement, not under human resources, I put it under culture of safety. It's your safety work of how do you continuously uh, work to improve your, your workplace environment and to engage the head and the heart of everyone around how is it that we can reduce falls in our organization. Next slide, please. So one of the things uh, that I want to share with you and, and uh, is the actual patient safety solutions. Challenge four is falls and fall prevention and it'll, it's being revised, it's gonna be released uh, in 2020, the World Summit, which is in March. In it, we have kind of the executive, executive summary checklist. We have tools, we have technology in there, we have action plans for you to use. Even though it's being revised right now, I would encourage you to check it out um, because so many times when we're looking at how we can design a fall prevention program that's sustainable, um, we have a tendency, again, to rely on the tactic side of it um, because the cultural transformation side of it is incredibly hard work. I also want you to think about and listen for, and I want to give you a, a model that I want you to take Next time, as you're out and about in your organization, just engage in a conversation with people about fall prevention. Ask them three simple questions. The first question is, do you fundamentally believe we can ever reach zero? Most will answer no. Open the door then to say, tell me what? Tell me more. Engage in that dialogue around 
why is that belief there? One of the things that I have uh, done extensive research around is the moral distress and the emotional distress that caregivers feel when a fall happens on their watch. I would encourage you as part of your fall prevention program is to develop a support system for your employees so that they're able to feel supported but also able to process. One of the other uh, questions that I want you to also ask is, do you feel the risk assessment we're utilizing guides you into being able to make an individualized safety plan? Most will answer to you, no, or yes, or maybe, but it starts to engage a conversation around what is missing. Then lean into that design thinking I told you about and look at what is it that you can do to assure that that assessment tool is bringing forward the information. Maybe it's how you're doing your safety huddles. Maybe it's your shift to shift report. You know your organization the best. And the third thing is, do you share the learnings of a debrief with your colleagues? Share with you, the vast majority of the organizations that I also have had the opportunity to work alongside keep their debriefs self-contained. What I find interesting is that there is incredible richness and knowledge that could be gained by openly sharing, by openly being transparent, because what's happened in one department will duplicate itself into another. Additionally, I gave you kind of a little bit of a heads up in that we are working on a mother uh, baby or maternal newborn um, and some of the work that, that's happening around that with our actual patient safety solution is really looking at the assessment tool. Um, and as I shared with you, it's designed for adults. It's not designed necessarily for maternal. And so we're asking organizations to start looking at and, and uh, working on developing a reliable, validated uh, assessment tool uh, for maternal child. But there's some really uh, interesting things that are happening out there for infant safety bundles coming soon to you in 2020. Next slide, please. So in summary, one of the things that I wanna share is that this is a global imperative. Do not just look to the research here within the United States. Canada's doing some fabulous things. Australia's doing some fabulous things. And the UK also is moving very heavily uh, into thinking and looking at what we can do differently. Additionally, um, fall prevention uh, requires an orchestrated uh, universal approach to saving lives. Think about how it is that you can create an organizational conversation. How is it that leadership, I don't care if you're over facilities or where you're at, really thinks about safety and thinks about fall prevention. You have to do reverse thinking to transform your cultures. And reverse thinking means is that what are the biases? You ask the question, what are the biases that are that's holding our, our organizations back around reducing falls? And I gave you one that's a very simplistic one about um, the belief system that falls occur in hospital settings. I would tell you, I think that's still out there. I think it's, it's uh, kind of a deeply entrenched but the other thing that you want to look at is when you think about reverse thinking to transform your culture is what are the unspoken biases? Confirmation biases is one. If you think about confirmation biases, we have a tendency to, to label somebody as, oh, this person is high risk for falls. And then you look for all the things that are high risk for falls. And by doing that, you're confirming that they're high risk, except Maybe there's some subtleties that were missed. Maybe there's some subtleties that could have changed an outcome. If I had more time, I could actually share one more story about that. What I wanna to say to you is, is that many times we get stuck in our lanes of thinking and it's when we step out of those lanes that we're able to really do transformation. Let hashtag leadership matters be your personal hashtag for safety. And fall prevention is not a program. It is the DNA of your actions for safety. And with that, um, the, I would ask you to look to the actual patient safety solutions 
And next slide, please. Thank you so much, yeah. Marty. This is the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. And at this time in closing, we're going to direct it to question and answer. So I'm going to turn it over to Ariana, who has been monitoring the commenting feature. Great. So thanks, everyone, to who's been commenting in the chat box. Remember, please, uh, you can still submit questions. Um, we should have time to address them all. And if you're on the web and would like to speak your question, if you hover over your name, a little hand that looks like it's waving should appear, and you can click that, which means we can unmute you and allow you to speak. Um, so the first question is, uh, maybe you misunderstood the statement, but why is it not suggested to have the patient move and instead have them sit down? Um, we think that, that that maybe others might have misheard. And Marty, if you could just reiterate uh, what your intent was and uh, if, if maybe there was a misunderstanding there. Oh, yeah, there's definitely a misunderstanding. What it is is, is uh, uh, the patient should be moving, as a matter of fact. That's what the latest research, as a matter of fact, Dr. Morris's research, I think it's coming out in 2020, has demonstrated that when you get the patient up and moving and ambulating and working on that core strength, um, you look at gait and balance, uh, that actually there's a reduction in falls. Um, so there's direct correlation. So I apologize if there was a misunderstanding. I was really saying we've worked so hard at keeping them safe and secure in their bed that in essence, we actually might have influenced uh, them falling when they try to get out of their bed. Great, thanks, Marty. Second question is um, from someone with the username Y849849, and they say, I'm a quality RN facilitating fall prevention in our hospital. Um, what are your thoughts on a fall when seemingly we have taken all actions to prevent that fall? An example, a confused patient with sitter jumps out of bed so fast and forcefully that the sitter was unable to stop him safely. Patient was not tolerant to more sedatives or restraint. Do you feel all falls can be prevented? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think all of us have had that experience where somebody's physically standing there and they bolt out of bed. Here's one of the things that I would encourage you to think about. Um, the question is, can all falls be prevented? There's a lot of debate in the research on that. I personally believe that we must keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper about why was the fall. So let's say that kind of uh, patient, what we, we know is, is one in four uh, med surge patients have an underlying behavioral health uh, uh, issue or maybe a diagnosis. Have you uh, brought in your behavioral health team to help you to really look at why would the all of a sudden agitation like that? Why would somebody suddenly jump out? Your geropsych people, you have to be leaning into them and go deeper into those debriefs, maybe utilizing them and looking at, you know, most, most places have done now their drug-drug interactions. They've got pharmacy on board. If you don't, get them on board. But expand the, the horizons and think about what, what's the causation of this individual doing that and who's the experts that might understand that and bring that in. Each time that's a shared learning that's going to help you to elevate your fall prevention. The other thing is, is the family. Talk, you know, I talked about uh, person and family engagement. Ask them really and truthfully the kinds of behaviors. This is what they're seeing. Why are they seeing it? What was the agitation uh, causation from? Really engage in that deeper dialogue. And a lot of times in debriefs, we don't do that. And we do our fish, we'll do our cause and effect diagrams. And we don't keep digging deeper and deeper. And I know it's time, but in those cases where you really don't have a clear understanding, look for it. Think about yourself as being Sherlock Holmes and, and really try to uncover the mystery of the why. Great, thanks. Another question from the same person. Do you have any statistical information? Um, and sorry, as questions come in, it um, jumps me down the page. So uh, do you have any statistical uh, data on correlation between RN staffing and fall rates? Oh, yeah, there's a ton out there. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head right now, um, but um, there is a lot of work. Uh, Linda Aiken actually is going to be releasing some work in the next 30, 60 days, I think, um, that has looked at, at RN uh, staffing in correlation to um, uh, fall prevention and, and, and the number of people. It's, a, it's an ongoing debate. I think it'll continue to be an ongoing debate. What we have seen, though, in California 
is that there really hasn't been that much of an influencer, meaning decrease of fall prevention in the hospital in, with the mandatory ratio. Now, the one thing I would share with you is the organizations that have seen fall prevention as an organi organizational initiative have seen reduction. So again, you know, don't focus it that it's just about nursing. It really is an organizational imperative. And many eyes, many people understanding what you're working on with safety actually creates a stronger safety net. Great. All right, another question. I'm interested in learning about fall risk scoring tool that's not subjective and has room for patients who don't appear like fall risks, but have risk factors such as hemodynamic changes. The Schmidt score is a very subjective and does not capture those patients. Yeah, yeah no, I totally agree. Um, I, you know, there's a few that I'm aware of that is currently being studied. Um, and one of the things that I'll do is just try to uh, do a little research for you on that and maybe post uh, a follow up uh, on to, to give you the answer on that. I don't want to pull it off on the top of my head, but um, I agree that there is, uh, well, there's a lot of work that's being, being done. Um, whether it's ready now for use is the question I've got to answer. Great. Thanks, Marty. Um, so we have a question or a comment from Karen Curtis, who is the co-chair of this actionable patient safety solution from the patient advocacy perspective. So Karen, thanks for joining today. Um, she made a comment just saying that CampaignZero.org offers fall prevention checklists to share with patients and families so they know what to watch for and uh, do to help prevent their loved ones from taking a fall. Also quickly explains fall risk and why shared vigilance with the entire care team for their loved one is important. So wanted to make sure that those people who are on the phone who might not have seen Karen's comment would know about the resource of CampaignZero.org. Yeah, that's um, excellent. Great. Uh, some other questions. We have lots here. Uh, from McGann, um, this person asked, do you know of programs that use safe patient handling equipment to facilitate earlier mobility? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, there are several programs out there for uh, safe patient handling uh, that you can, AHRQ has one that has, uh, you know, guidelines around safe patient handling. Um, and there's uh, several others uh, that you can utilize. And I apologize, I actually should have touched on that, that safe patient handling to get people up and, and mobile is absolutely uh, part of the kind of total fall uh, prevention aspect. One of the things that we know, though, is uh, nurses have a tendency to not uh, utilize uh, um, um, oh, scales or to elevate them uh, if they have to go and get them. And that's that, that human-centered design of looking at your processes and your symptoms. Make sure that, that you have the right tools uh, just immediately available to kind of go into that workflow. And then thinking about how do you utilize uh, people um, really in kind of that move team is one of the things that I've seen where people are just literally kind of working to get people to move and they're kind of going throughout the hospital instead of the lift teams or the transfer teams, which is kind of cool. It's a, it's a cool idea. They're, they're partnering up with uh, universities that uh, have training programs for physical therapists. So something to think about, but yes, yeah, safe patient handling has to be part of that. Great. Um, so we do have a few more questions. We'll try to um, get through them all. Uh, one, uh, one question that's been repeated is, will the slides be available, presentation be available? Um, yes, it will be on our website within 24 hours, as well as on YouTube for you to share. Um, another question is, uh, an earlier slide showed number of lives saved annually. How was this measured? I'm happy to handle that. So um, when we uh, ask for hospitals to commit to the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, they share with us their processes around um, the patient safety initiatives. And if those um, initiatives have a standardized way of calculating morbidity or mortality, uh, the hospital has the opportunity to share that, providing background if they're not using the methodology that we use and advertise and, and list in our actionable patient safety solutions. So it's self-reported um, on an annual basis by those hospitals. Um, someone asks, uh, can you repeat the Penn State reference? Oh, yes, absolutely. It's called design thinking coming out of uh, the uh, School of Nursing, College of Nursing at Penn State. Um, so 
but if you put in design thinking, they, they have developed the course to where it's downloadable, it's free, it's fabulous, it's based on IDEO's work, which um, is incredible around human-centered design. Great, and I know we're right at the top of the hour, it just turned 11 o'clock Pacific time. There's one more question that I think is relevant. Um, when uh, Delilah asks, I work in a facility where a majority of patients don't have family. How do we go about that after your family suggestion? You know, uh, yeah, that, that's a challenge uh, in today's environment, there's no doubt. What I would ask is, is broaden the terminology of family. Is there a, a friend, a loved one, somebody that's involved in this individual's life? Um, and broaden that family component um, to where you can then engage in them. You know, many times families live apart and there's somebody then that the individual is close to who knows them. And that may be the individual that you have the conversation with. It's hard, I, I, I totally agree, but it is something to really work hard on. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for, Marty, for your presentation and for everyone in attendance for posing those questions. Just in closing, I want to highlight that the patient safety newsletter um, is available to those who sign up online at patientsafetymovement.org and mark follow our progress. Um, it's a great way to stay up to date on patient safety movement events, initiatives, um, and different articles and spotlights we like to highlight. Um, secondly, our upcoming 2020 World Patient Safety Science and Technology Summit is to take place on March 5th through the 7th uh, in Huntington Beach, California. Um, we encourage you to follow our website find some more information on that. We hope to see you in attendance. It will be a wonderful event. And then finally, our next quarterly webinar to open up the 2020 year will take place probably mid-March following the summit. Um, we hope that you guys will be in attendance. Again, following this will be a, a survey um, to just capture some um, comments and feedback on this webinar. We thank you for your time and appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.